And that right there is the medicine America needs, right? <laughs> Um, pleased to bring up our next comedian. Uh, no? Okay, no, our first panel. We're having our first panel. Uh, it is going to be a discussion about how we got here, how America became so bitterly divided and what we can do about it. And we're going to hear from individuals with unique perspectives about this from across the political spectrum and hopefully see what all of us can do about that. I am also uh, pleased now to welcome our moderator for this discussion, Grace Panetta. She's a political reporter with the 19th News. So please join me in welcoming her and congratulating her on her new job. That was great. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to the organizers of Unconvention. Okay. I'm so excited to be moderating a great panel on polarization featuring four amazing leaders in their communities. First, State Representative uh, Jordan Ecker of Pennsylvania, State Representative Jordan Harris, uh, John Wood Jr., and Jose Felix Diaz. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here and for joining us, and thanks again to the Bipartisan Policy Center, uh, Unite America, and Michael Smirkanish uh, for convening us all here today. Um, we're going to spend the next 45 minutes solving polarization, maybe not, but at least uh, talking about it with these four really, really, really distinguished leaders. Um, and what's special about this panel is that these leaders are all deeply rooted in their communities. And there's a lot of data and sort of a lot of facts um, to confirm the polarization of America. And I'm sure later in the day we'll hear about some of the structural factors contributing to it. But for the time we have, I want to focus on sort of the human and community-based roots of polarization and then also the tools in, at the community level to overcome it and to bridge those divides. Um, and we're going to be discussing that with this stellar group of panelists who have a lot of firsthand experience and insights to share. Um, and another great thing about this panel is that all of our panelists are uh, millennials who have either uh, in elected office, have served in elected office, or have been involved in politics. Um, so you all have a really unique generational perspective on this particular moment. Um, and so to start, I sort of want to ask everyone, um, starting with Representative Ecker, how do you think we got here to this moment uh, where both in legislative uh, level and in communities, everything seems so polarized and divided? Well, first of all, I want to thank you everybody for being here, and, and this is a great opportunity, and we are the guinea pigs of the day with the first panel, so it's, it's good to be that, per, that group. But look, I think as a society, as, as, a, as politics, we started not focusing on issues and got away from issues, talking about issues and talking about things that are important in our communities, and started focusing on, person, focusing on personalities and people, um, the candidates themselves, not so much the issues they're talking about. And I think... Uh, you know, we've gone through some tumultuous times uh, in, in, American, you know, in American history, and this is one of them where we, we dealt with a global pandemic. It, it changed how we approach the world, and I think people reacted differently. Now it's time, like every other time in American history, to come back, figure this out, and get back on track. Thank you. Representative Harris? Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Uh, hello to my mother who's watching. <laughs> you always got to shout out your mom. Um, you know, I think information is power, right? And it's typically a good thing. But I think sometimes information overload uh, can be bad and can show um, and highlight the divisions that we have in our country. I think what you see is that um, America is very segregated. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we're very segregated. I go to a predominantly black church, and if you're religious, you probably go to a church where most of the people look like you. Um, and when you think about that, that is actually how our information is as well. It used to be when I would sit with my grandmother, she would turn on one news station in her living room, and most of the people in her community were looking at that news station. That's where you were getting your information. Now we're so segregated that you can watch your news, you can watch your news, you can watch yours, and you can watch yours. And we could be talking about the same thing and talking about different things all at the same time. So when you get to work on Monday, there's never really that water cooler moment that folks used to have where you could hash out what was said. 
Now it's more or less, um, you know, everybody's spin and instead of information is more infotainment. And we've become, in my view, somewhat of elitist about information because now if you don't agree with everything I say, you're dumb. Like not, not we disagree, <laughs> you're dumb. Right. Or if I don't agree with what you say, I'm dumb. You know what I mean? So we've just gotten to a place where it's that information, uh, that overload in my view, is hindering us from having those water cooler conversations that really strengthen our country. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Um, Torin and Jordan are both right in everything that they say. I would say that the problem of polarization in American society is overdetermined. And it's probably important to sort of differentiate it between factors that were inevitable and always were going to take place and see how those link up with things that are really unique problems in the context of, of American life and this point in the 21st century. I mean, on the one hand, American society has become far more diverse. And I mean that not just simply in terms of straight across demographic diversity, but within our institutions. You know, it used to be a time in American life where African Americans, uh, gender and uh, women and, and people of, of alternative and different sexual lifestyles did not have a voice in the narrative conversation over American identity. But now, you know, you have more diverse voices within the university system, within politics, within corporations. And it means that there are different ways of viewing American history that are interacting with each other in manners that are causing us to adjust to one another's worldviews. This is healthy tension. You want that in a democracy. But it happens at a moment where you also have, to Jordan's point, the diversification of the news media in a way that means that right at a moment where we should be understanding one another better, we are locked in our own eco chambers. That began with the proliferation of cable news channels, talk radio, all of that before the advent of social media. You add social media to that, and suddenly we have a circumstance within which the major institutions of our society in so many respects, media, political parties, have a built-in incentive to divide us with the information tools at our disposal, giving us the means to divide ourselves from one another. And in that context, an already challenging demographic reality in American life finds itself artificially exacerbated by bad incentives and structures for communication that had all the promise in the world to bring us together and yet have had the unintended consequence of driving us apart when we look at Twitter and Facebook and these other things. And so that's the unique, challenging moment we live in. But, uh, but to Mr. Ecker's point, you know, it's just another moment for America to overcome. So it's nothing we can't handle at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, it's always terrible to go forth <laughs> uh, after everybody's gone, I was so excited to tell you about my view on social media, uh, but, but John beat me to it. But I, I do think that uh, social media is such a wonderful thing. Um, I love keeping in contact with kids that I played baseball with when I was five years old and watching them raising their kids now. And, you know, that girl that sat next to me in high school, it's amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, I do think that social media and, and particularly the algorithms that run social media um, are a big part of why we're here. Um, I was elected to the Florida House of Representatives in 2010, and I don't want to say that those were golden times, but looking back now, in terms of bipartisanship, uh, the dialogue was different. Um, and I do think that Twitter and Instagram and Facebook unfortunately reward bad behavior. So the more controversial you are, the more negative you are, the more you attack other people, the higher likelihood you have of getting more followers. So that has now become a thing in politics. I mean, when I served, you would never talk poorly about one of your colleagues. They were your colleagues. Um, you were in it together. And today I see a lot of the young elected officials constantly attacking each other and calling each other's uh, names and baiting each other because it leads to more clicks. So I unfortunately think that we're living in a time where everybody's still figuring out social media. And I think that unfortunately there's a whole generation, my grandmother 
who's, by the way, 91 on Facebook and sending me pictures all day. <laughs> my, my grandmother is, is, is in a position where she fully doesn't understand the algorithms and the way they work and the disinformation. And that's like a lost generation on social media. But the next generation I have faith in, the Gen Zs and the millennials that understand that there's more to this than I, I might have initially thought. Why is it that I'm only getting this perspective? Hopefully that generation has an opportunity to, to fix the problems we're having on social media because otherwise things are just gonna continue to get worse. Thank you. Um, and since you mentioned uh, the dynamics in state legislatures, that's a perfect jumping off point because we are extremely lucky to have two currently serving members of the Pennsylvania legislature uh, on stage today. Representative Ecker is a Republican representing Cumberland and Adams counties, and Representative Harris is a Democrat uh, representing Southeast Philadelphia, not too far from here. And I would love to hear a little bit from you both about how you overcome both the partisan divides in the legislature and also when you go back into your communities and you're talking to people who, you know, as we've all mentioned, are sort of in their echo chambers, whether it's social media or just self-sorting. How have you been able to overcome that? Well, I guess I'll go first. Uh, you know, Jordan is, is definitely the, the leader in this realm, he, he, and I'll let him speak about some of the efforts he's done bipartisanly in, in Pennsylvania that's been a, a model across the, the country, really, when it comes to criminal justice reform. But I think for, we both represent districts that are very tilted one way. You know, my district is 70% Republican, 30% Democrat, and I'm sure Jordan, your district probably tips the other way. And and I think the challenge that we run into, at least I run into, is making sure that when I came into office that I was accessible and open, my door was open to everybody, whether we agreed or disagreed on any issues. And that's, that's held true for me. And I live in an area that's, that's very partisan at times. And, and, but to cut through that is meeting with people, listening to them, finding common ground. And, and look, sometimes you're going to disagree with folks. Our founding fathers did not get along very well. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams fought tooth and nail with each other in the press. They were not quite, quite very kind to each other. And this, is, this, this happens. That doesn't, so when it comes to being a legislator in the state, it's focusing on issues that you can work on, criminal justice reform. Here in the state, we, we pass a, 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 tax, a, a huge tax cut that was a bipartisan in nature. Look, I, I think Pennsylvania is, by definition, the, as purple as it gets. We are a, a, the, the legislators are controlled by the Republicans, and the, the governor's office is controlled by a Democrat. And we are forced every year to have to come together and pass a budget on time in June. We're forced to have to work together. And, and, and that's, that's just the reality. Our Constitution requires it, and, and our state Constitution requires it. So I think uniquely to Pennsylvania, which I think is really a demo, demographically kind of symbolizes what Mer America is as a whole, is that we have folks from very different parts of the state that have very different backgrounds, both regionally and politically, and we have to come and find ways to move this state forward. And I think we've done a good job. I mean, obviously you see rhetoric and things in the news, again, going back to, to our news and, and social media, but, but we do get a lot of things done in Harrisburg. Uh, I think only 7% of our bills this session have been uh, by party line votes. Overwhelmingly, have the, they have been either bipartisan. I think roughly 50 some percent have been, a little under 50 percent have been unanimously adopted out of our house. So I think that shows uh, that we, although you hear some of the rhetoric in the news, there is a lot of common ground that we work on. Well, uh, I, I, if I'm being honest, um, y'all can't tell nobody if I tell y'all. Uh, <laughs> the way I get a lot of stuff done is a lot of alcohol. Uh, <laughs> Jim. Jim, John, and Jack are some of my best <laughs> friends uh, in, in, my, in my office. Um, um, but, but, you know, I heard Chris Christie, uh, and, you know, I don't know if I'll get in trouble politically for quoting Chris Christie. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I heard Chris Christie say something at uh, the, our chamber event just this week. He said, and he was quoting somebody, and I don't remember who he's quoting, but what he said was, it's hard to hate people up close. And that is the honest to God truth, right? When I know your mother's name, when I know the name of your children, when I know the name of your cat or your dog or whatever animal you may have in your house, 
when I've had dinner with you and your spouse, it's hard for me to get on social media and rail against you, right? It's just hard for me to do that because just last week we were having dinner together, right? right? And a lot of times, you know, in our body politics, people demonize you know, that, oh, they're out dinner and they're out drinking and they're out, yeah, I am, I am. And I'm getting to know, I mean, I guess you can tell I was out to dinner. Um, <laughs> it's okay. But, you know, yeah, I am, but I'm, I'm getting to know the person that I'm working with. And that is important because politics, in my view, when it comes to bipartisanship, you have to have a certain level of trust. I need to know that you're not gonna screw me and you need to know that I'm not going to screw you. And I need to know where your line is, and you need to know where my line is. And in Pennsylvania, we've done that. I have a, a Republican colleague that I work on criminal justice reform with a lot. Her name is Cheryl Delosier. She's a white, middle-aged Republican woman from Cumberland County. I'm a black guy, in case you didn't know. Uh, full beard from South Philly. We have absolutely nothing in common. <laughs> so you would think until we actually sat down, started talking, you know, having a glass of wine, although Cheryl likes beer more than she likes wine, so I'll make sure the beer is on tap for Cheryl, and we have a really good time. She loves baseball as well. Actually, she actually houses a lot of the baseball players in the minor leagues in her home with her and her husband. Wouldn't have known that had I not gone out to dinner with her. But I know where her line is. She knows where my line is. I know what issues she can talk about. I know what issues she can't talk about. And she knows the same about me. So it's hard to hate people when you are working and dealing with them up close. So we have to get back to the personal nature of politics. The other thing I'll say is that we need to understand that there's a difference between campaigns and governing. A lot of times, we take what happens in the campaign cycle and think that that can run right into governing. No, after election day, we're all Americans. We're all Pennsylvanians. We're all whatever city it is that you're from, right? <laughs> and at the end of the day, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, independent, or anything in between, the people sent you to whatever house you're serving in to get something done for them. You know what I mean? And so for me, I really internalize that because I go home to my house in South Philly where just last week, 250 feet from my home, there were 20 bullets that ran out, that rang out. Mm. Thank God no one was hit, but there was a shooting not too far from where I lay my head. When I go into the supermarket, I see that there are people who cannot afford the rising price of food. When I go to the pump, I see that there are people who cannot afford the rising price of gas. Now, we can have our political debates on why that's happening, but the, 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 the center of that that we should find ourselves in is that we have to fix it and we have to help people. And I think when you keep that in mind, I think that helps us get things done in a bipartisan manner, uh, and it helps us actually move the country forward together. Mm. Thank you so much. Well said. Well said. Thank you so much, representatives, um, for sharing your experiences. It's really, really great to have you here. Um, I want to turn now to Jose, who's a former elected official, uh, as he mentioned, and I'd love to hear a little bit about the evolution um, that you've seen in partisanship and polarization in Florida, which is a, like Pennsylvania, hotly contested battleground state, yeah. um, seen a lot of political changes over the last decade. And so similar to what I asked uh, the representatives from Pennsylvania here, how have you seen polarization evolve and what strategies have you used to try to overcome it, both in your capacity as a lawmaker and on the outside uh, in the various community organizations you've been involved with? Of course. Um, and um, I, I'll, I'll correct you for a second. Yes. I'm not a former elected official. I'm a recovering elected <laughs> official. Uh, it, it, it's certainly hard to give up. Uh, but I, I, I've, I've certainly seen um, a change. And I, I like to say it's a change for the better, but it's unfortunately a change for the worse. Um, one of the beautiful things about sta state legislators uh, is that they actually get things done. I mean, look at Congress. You, you can't even talk to somebody from the other party, and that's frozen our federal government for the past decade. And I remember saying when I first got elected 
that I loved that most of the pieces of legislation that I worked on were bipartisan. They usually had a co-sponsor that was of the other party, and that is happening less and less now, yeah. um, especially uh, in Florida. I think that uh, the last two presidential elections have been very divisive. I think that Florida has been at the epicenter of a lot of the spend that the big campaigns have done. So a lot of the people that have been elected are maybe a little further right or maybe a little further left. And um, that's always dangerous. I mean, I, I hate hearing from the far left as much as I hate hearing from the far right. I think that they're both equally scary. Uh, so, you know, I am, you mentioned organizations. Um, I am a proud new member of a group called the Millennial Action Project whose mission it is to develop young legislators and teach them about the importance of bipartisanship. Uh, they have 31 different future caucuses in 31 different state capitals, and they uh, teach young legislators how to work together. Um, and these future caucuses are sprouting bipartisan legislation. Uh, later this year, uh, there will be a report produced by this group uh, called the future uh, of future state leadership. And that report shows optimism. It shows that there's as many as 5,900 different pieces of legislation in the last year that have been filed in a bipartisan manner. Uh, and it also shows that even though less than 20% of all elected state legislators across the United States um, are under the age of 45, more than one out of every three pieces of bipartisan legislation are being filed by young state legislators. So hope is not lost. Uh, I think that the hope is still there, and I think that, you know, there is a, 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 a reckoning coming upon us, and that is, you know, are we going to break or are we going to mend? Um, and I have certainly dedicated myself uh, and the next decade of my life to helping us men. And that's why it was a great honor to be asked to come speak here. And I hope to take this message on the road and go to different young state legislators, young city commissioners, young county commissioners, and let them know that there's a better way. And that better way is work together, listen to each other, be peaceful, be kind, uh, because the only way we can change the world is by starting with ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and on that point about sort of changing the conversation and the incentives, um, I want to turn out to John. Uh, John Wood Jr. is um, your uh, writer, public speaker, podcaster, and formerly in the leadership of the Los Angeles, Los Angeles County uh, Republican Party. Um, and many of us think of Los Angeles as just a super blue area. I'm curious to hear a little bit about how your work in Republican politics in that area influenced, you know, your view of these issues and how it affects uh, your work now. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, first of all, let me just, uh, let me just say, Grace, and to, to everybody here, that it really is, uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be in the company of, uh, of three, to my, to my point of view, uh, old school politicians. And what I mean by old school in this context is, you know, people who- Are you who... calling me old? Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I'm joking. I, I'm, I'm, I might have seen a gray hair in the beard. I wouldn't go say nothing, Jordan, but, you know, but, but old, school, old school in the sense that they actually define their job, you know, as, as politicians according to their ability to work constructively across disagreements, right? That should be the skill set and the attitude that we actually looked for, look for and the people that we send um, to, the, to our state capitals and to Washington, D.C. Um, and, uh, but, but Jordan, I'm going to get you into trouble here a little bit, because when you were talking, I couldn't help but think to myself that, you know what, Jordan Harris kind of reminds me of Ronald Reagan. And the reason I said that, I, <laughs> oh, I told you, I told you, I told you, that's all right, that's all right. He may not answer my calls later, but, you know, we work across the But the reason I say that is because, you know, I heard a, a story, Chris Matthews, uh, used to be an aide to uh, uh, Tip O'Neill, uh, who was a Democratic uh, leader in the House of Representatives during uh, much of Reagan's uh, time. And um, he told a story about Ronald Reagan wandering into Tip's office um, after hours 
and uh, Matthew said something to him along the lines of, oh, uh, you know, Mr. President, uh, you've wandered uh, across enemy lines. And Reagan responded by saying something along the lines of, not after six. We're all friends after six o'clock. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and of course, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill had a very famous uh, sort of camaraderie, a famous uh, relationship, which did allow them to work across the aisle in a time that, you know, 1980s, I think many Americans felt, you know, post-Watergate and so forth, that divisions were perhaps pretty bad, you know, back then, and yet they set that example as emblematic of their sort of leadership. I am a registered Republican, you know, um, absolutely, uh, no shame in that, and yet, you know, I got into politics because of Barack Obama. I, I got into politics as somebody who's an activist on the ground because I was inspired by this message of our being not just red states or blue states, but the United States of America, not just black, Latino, uh, black America, Latino or white, but rather the United States of America across color lines, across party lines. Uh, a vision of our society that stands in accordance with this idea that we are e pluribus unum, out of many one. Our party differences don't have to define us as human beings to one another. Now, I tried to bring that perspective sort of to you know, the Republican Party on an institutional level when I was elected uh, vice chairman of the, of the Republican Party of Los Angeles County. I wound up getting into trouble not just for trying to bridge the gap between Democrats and Republicans, but for being too friendly with the wrong Republicans <laughs> you know, within, within the larger sort of party ecosystem. And that's just to say that the incentives for us to polarize and to divide, you know, are deeply etched in the current sort of party fabric, right? On both sides, I think. And so, you know, um, incentives matter, structures matter. They're difficult to overcome. What I do in the work that, um, you know, I'm, I'm committed to with Braver Angels, and Grace, if this is a, a good moment for me to say a little bit about that, Braver Angels is America's largest grassroots bipartisan organization dedicated to the work of political depolarization. We have programs that are uh, rolling out uh, in the United States Congress, on college campuses across America, in state houses and municipal governments across the country. We even have a singer-songwriter community, about 150 strong or so, of artists and musicians who are using uh, art and culture in programs and workshops meant to help us cross the divide in deeper ways. But we are fundamentally grassroots. Uh, right now, about 11,000 dues-paying members across America, but our programs touch many, many more people than that, and about 80 or so local bipartisan alliances. It started with a workshop that we conducted in the aftermath of the 2016 election in a place called South Lebanon, Ohio, uh, a place that had just split very evenly for Trump and for Clinton. And we put folks through a couple of days of interactions where and we sought to sort of answer this question, do the American people still find common ground with each other? And from that, our programs sort of emerge. Now, sort of what do we do exactly? Well, you know, we give Republicans and Democrats and people who lean left and lean right the space not to argue or debate politics, but to speak from the vantage point of their own life or lived experience, if you will, with respect to why they see politics the way that they do. So it's quite literally the application of marriage counseling techniques to the relationship between Republicans and Democrats, which would seem appropriate for a country on the verge of divorce much of the time. The thing I would want to drive home, though, is just the fundamentals that we've been talking about in this conversation so far. A lot of us want to think in terms, and rightfully so, of you know, structural reform, electoral reform, you know, how can we change the incentive structure for the parties, for the media, and so forth? We think about rearranging the larger levers of power and so forth in American democracy, and that's all well and good. If you cannot, however, build reform upon a stronger foundation, upon a stronger fabric of interpersonal and intergroup relationships as they exist between the American people, then any and everything we do in our institutions is going to be meaningless at the end of the day because we will only follow the rules insofar as they allow us to get over on one another. And as soon as that stops being true, we will break the rules. And we will look for ways to not earnestly and honestly engage with one another. So I consider myself and try to be a student of Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy of nonviolence. And what Dr. King taught was that we do not seek to defeat or humiliate the opponent. Rather, we seek to win his friendship and understanding so that we may be reconciled to one another in the beloved community. The idea being that you can fervently disagree with somebody and still love them and still have goodwill for them. And that if you can demonstrate that in your actions, in the way that you speak, 
The disagreements won't simply disappear. But by showing that person that you are not fundamentally their enemy, that you speak the truth or seek the things that you believe so you can help create a better nation, a better world for him and his children as well, then suddenly you've given that person moral, emotional, and psychological permission to listen to you, right? And when we start to listen to each other again, we find ourselves in a shared state of mind to where we can begin to reason with each other again. And look further down the road, not just to the next election cycle, asking this question, who's going to win an election, who's going to hold the levers of power for another two or four years, but actually look down the road with respect to the generations that are going to follow us. Are we going to leave our country, uh, are we going to leave our children a country that they can share together? That only happens if we're starting from a place of love and goodwill towards each other. It is not Pollyannish. It is the one thing that can save the very systems that operate the greater structures of American democracy. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think that does get at a really important point, right? Because there are structures, at the end of the day, you know, our democracy starts and ends with us as people. We choose how we engage with others, we choose what news sources we read, how we engage on social media, um, but we really can have more power than we think to shape our democracy because democracy is not given. It's something that has to be you know, worked at and worked to maintain. So in the few minutes that we have left, um, I want to end on a, a positive <laughs> note so that this isn't just a depressing panel about all the problems. Um, and I'd love to hear briefly from all of our panelists about where we go from here and what are some you know, small things that all of us and you all can take back into your communities um, to work this, on this work of depolarization. Sure. So I, I think the starting point is, like Jordan said, we have an election coming up, but after that election, it's time to get to work. It's time to, to find the issues, find people, meet people where they are, and work together. <clears throat> I, I know for me personally, I, I'm committed to, to finding some people on the other side of the aisle that I've worked with before, but actually getting those things done next session. Actually working on things, uh, a, a good friend um, in, up in the Scranton area, who, uh, Kyle Mullins, who's work, he, he and I are both young dads, and we, we're working on, on uh, legislation dealing with bullying and things like that. Just working on things that I think most people can get around, and making those issues, bringing those issues out, out into the, the light. Because we hear about the issues that we disagree on, we need to hear about the issues we don't disagree on. And that is the, that's my goal, that's my commitment to you folks, is, is to start focusing on those issues while still working and keeping true to your core beliefs, but working on issues that you know you can solve, that you know you can fix, so that it builds upon each other, so that when you work together with that person across the aisle, that when you get to that tough vote, you can have those conversations to get a compromise there, which again, isn't a dirty word. So that's my commitment, that's what I hope to do. I mean, John over here quoting Dr. King. So like, <laughs> I'm just like, whatever I say is going to be inadequate. Um, right? Nah. Um, People will be quoting Jordan Harris. No. Um, it's going to sound cheesy, um, but it's really how I feel. We have to get back to seeing the humanity in each of us, regardless of political ideology. How do I see your humanity? I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you. I mean, we were standing back, we were all talking, having a good time before we came out. I knew Torrin was a Republican. I didn't read y'all bios and see that all he, that y'all was Republican too. And I was just like, when he said, I'm like, you, I'm thinking, like, you a Republican? <laughs> Damn. I get okay. That. <laughs> hey, who knew? Um, I say that in a joking, I say that in a joking manner because at the end of the day, when you do get to see the humanity of people, you understand that you have policy differences, you have political differences, but that we're all people. And that at the end of, of all of this, we want, in my view, usually we want the same things, good schools, safe streets, you know, clean streets, a government that works, you know, if you're a grandparent, you want the best for your grandchildren. If you're a parent, you want the best for your kids. Uh, you know, if you're, you know, uh, you know, you're talking about you and Kyle Mullins, a good friend of mine in my caucus, you guys sit and y'all talk about your kids and, and the dreams and the aspirations that you have.
for your children. That's who we typically are as people. And when we put aside the R and the D, that's usually where we end up. If you sit long enough with a new father, he's gonna show you a picture of his child. You sit long enough with a mom, that picture of their child is gonna come out. If you sat long enough with my grandmother, she was gonna tell you about her grandbaby Jordan Harris. It was going to happen because that's who we are as people. That doesn't mean we deny the political and policy disagreements that we have. We will have them, but we have them differently when we see the humanity in each and every one. So if I could press upon anybody, Democrat, Republican, uh, independent, uh, whatever your ideology is, see the humanity in everyone you speak to, because if you see them as human beings, you actually will see them more like you see yourself and less as an enemy. Thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. <clears throat>